Hello and welcome to our next webinar session. So my name is Mark Keane, uh, Managing Director for Hidec in Australia and New Zealand and I'm very proud to be presenting today uh, to you on the subject of oil conditioning. Now this is part one of a three-part series that we're running and I'm starting with water removal from oil. And the reason I'm starting with that is because I think it's a very important topic and it's a topic which is very frequently forgotten about uh, in our industry and I'll explain more of that as we go through. As we have an opportunity today to show you something new as well, uh, I'm very excited to be able to introduce to you a new product uh, that we've been working on for the last couple of years uh, with a very interesting technology and so that'll form part of our presentation today. So first of all I want to cover why why we're talking about removing water from oil. I think that um, moisture in oil uh, is a very common thing. And very often people only see water when it gets to the point of free water, uh, when it's already a very severe problem. But we're gonna talk about all forms of water uh, in moisture. We'll also talk about uh, why the product uh, is, is good, how does it work, and why this particular product that we're releasing uh, is quite unique. Uh, it has some very interesting developments in there. So let's move to uh, a preview here. This, this model we're going to show is uh, called H2Go as our branding there. And uh, the model that we will demonstrate for you is a 27. The 27 is 27 liters per minute. And uh, don't be deceived by the flow rate here. Uh, we've tested this unit against a number of other competitors' products up to 50 liters a minute, and we have superior water removal. So uh, it's not about the flow rate, it's about the performance of the product. So let's get some basics on uh, water in oil and uh, why we're concerned about that. So as, as you would be aware, if you've uh, studied uh, hydraulics, the, the common numbers that are given are 70% of the problems in hydraulics are related to fluid condition. We know that very well from filtration and uh, heat in systems, uh, but quite often water and moisture is ignored uh, or not well understood in there. So we'll, today we'll go into a bit of the chemistry of that and uh, why that is important to us. It's definitely important when we're considering how long can we make the oil last for and how long should the oil last and you know, what sort of things we can do to increase that. So if we talk about why does oil degrade, typically the reasons that it's degrading are related to thermal degradation, which we will cover in a separate session, or oxidation. And that's gonna be really our main point of discussion today is oxidation. Oxidation is uh, formed when certain things are introduced into the oil. One of those is water. Uh, of course, aeration and contamination are the others. And we'll cover all of those topics in the three-part series. So to make it simple, I've, uh, I've done some drawings. And uh, if you bear with me, these are my uh, images of molecules. And we start off with uh, all of the oils have a, a base stock of oil. And what is added to those uh, are very important additives, which could be anti-foaming, uh, viscosity stabilizing, and other wear enhancing uh, additives to make the oil perform better under the arduous conditions. Also very important are that phenols and amines are typically added, and these are uh, the antioxidants. And uh, we all know from uh, eating apples and drinking a little red wine that antioxidants are very important. They're very important to our oil as well, and we'll, we'll explain that for you. So our enemy here is anything which causes oxidation. And oxidation, you'd be familiar with the effects of that. Uh, rust is a typical example, but we, we call the process redox, and it's damaging uh, of components through a change caused by the interaction with oxygen. Now, why oxygen? Well, oxygen is a very interesting uh, molecular structure. O2, uh, that's not because of uh, two molecules uh, or two atoms of uh, oxygen. It's two rings of electrons for the uh, oxygen atom. And the 
outer ring here is quite unique in the fact that it's a little bit unstable from uh, a chemistry point of view. It can interact very easily with other uh, elements. So how does that affect us with water? Because today's subject is uh, water removal. And if we look here, of course, uh, in water, we have a primary, uh, we have an oxygen uh, atom and uh, two hydrogen atoms bonded together here. And it still can form radicals by interacting with catalysts in the system. So those electrons, which have the propensity to react, uh, are still very active in the water molecule and uh, water can cause us problems of reaction there. Now, if we look at other influencing factors, those are things like temperature. So on this graph here, you can see that temperature is a very big influence to the number of hours that we could expect oil to last for. And the reason why it's doing uh, this accelerated aging with temperature uh, is because the temperature increases the reactive time or reactive space and accelerates that process. So let's have a look at our typical hydraulic oils here and how they're working. So we have uh, all of our additives reacting together, working together to enhance the oil and uh, protect the system. But what happens over a period of time is that if we have oxidation, we end up with depletion of the additives. And that is very much accelerated by moisture in the oil. That depletion not only depletes our antioxidants, uh, but eventually it will rob us of all of the important additives in the oil, and the oil will not perform anything like a normal hydraulic oil or lubrication oil should. So what happens is that we have free radicals are formed and those radicals are formed by the interaction of uh, oxygen with other uh, metals typically, uh, so contaminants in the system, but also with aeration and most systems have some aeration in them. And uh, what is happening with our additives here is that uh, the amines are catching the radicals. So that's the job that they are doing as an antioxidant. But of course, they themselves would become depleted quite quickly. And so the phenols are behind those and they regenerate the amines and allow them to work for a longer period without becoming saturated. So both are critically important in the system. Now, when we talk about the damage which is done, it's very much accelerated by a combination of factors. And we talk about dirt, air and water, moisture in the system, all reacting together. What can happen is a rapid depletion of the additives in the system. And that can happen when you have bonding. And bonding is a very critical thing in that our antioxidants and the other additives in the oil can be bonded together. If that happens, you have a, a bigger problem and a much faster depletion. And the reason why is a normal filtration system will not filter out the additives Clearly, we don't want them to filter out the additives. And the reason it doesn't do that is because the additives have a maximum physical size of about 0.3 of one micron. But if oxidation occurs and bonding occurs, then it's possible that a normal filter could in fact filter out some of the additives, which is exactly what we don't want to happen. So let's have a look here at a 10 micron filter, typical in a hydraulic system. 10 micron filter is going to catch all of the 10 micron particles, we hope. Uh, certainly, it will also catch 5 micron particles, and it'll even catch some 2 micron particles. That's the nature of high-level filtration. Now, normally, that's not a problem. But if we have bonded and damaged additives, they can form particles of a size which also could be filtered out. And that's a very dangerous thing that could happen to rapidly deplete our oil additives. Of course, keeping the oil clean is very, very critical. Uh, most of our time in filtration, uh, we're looking at keeping our particle counts down, but we have to think about what those particles are. Very often those particles are reactive particles. Uh, they're ferrous and other contaminants in the system and they react very strongly as a catalyst when exposed to moisture and air. 
And of course, if we add any heat into that equation, that becomes very critical. We get an acceleration of oxidation. We may see that sort of damage uh, as evident in things like varnish formation in the system, which is the damaged oil, the damaged additives uh, precipitating out of the oil. And we'll have a session on that uh, in another webinar that we're doing. So to look at what sort of oils, we get the question a lot of time, uh, are all the oils the same? What should we be looking for in the oils? I won't ask you to read all of this. We'll be sharing uh, this for you. You can uh, watch it again later, or you can download the information here. But typically for our hydraulic oils, most of them are HMHL type fluids and they're normal mineral based oils uh, or variations on that uh, with additives. Now, if we look at the API values for different oil types, we get the question, you know, is this going to be different for different types of oil? It's really very similar for many types of oil. And if we look at uh, today, most of the current oils in the market are going to be group two or above uh, because the older oils, which were sulfur uh, laden, are not very popular from an environmental point of view. But typically, all of the oils need to be protected from oxidation. So we said, right, well, we can put clean, dry oil in the system. That would be a great starting point. Uh, but it's not always the starting point that you imagine. If we have a look here, we can see that samples from new supply very often show moisture saturation levels of between 20 to 40 percent. And that is particularly high. Uh, that is a bad starting point. And just because you've put clean, fresh oil in the system uh, doesn't mean that it's in perfect condition. We strongly suggest that you filter new oil going into the system. But you should also in many times uh, consider also drying the oil with a vacuum dehumidifier before adding it into the system because the dry oil will definitely have an enhanced life. So what is dry oil? Uh, one of the difficulties we have is very often when I see a lab report, uh, two things happen. So from the lab report, we see that uh, moisture or saturation of the oil is quite often omitted. And unless you specifically ask for checking of water or moisture in oil, you don't get it. And if you do get it, you're going to get a PPM value. So do I need to know uh, what is a PPM value, parts per million? Uh, do I understand how that reacts with my oil? Uh, is it the same for all of the oils? The real answer is that PPM is not the best indicator and uh, that when we're talking about uh, different oils and different saturation points, we have to think about it in a different way. So let's have a look here at some typical oils. And what you can see here is the amount of moisture which can be saturated into the oil in PPM before you get free water varies quite dramatically from the different oils. We can see ranges anywhere here from 10 to 5,000 ppm uh, before we would have free water evident in the oil. So let's have a look at the overall range of oils. And here in the hydraulic oil, again, you can see typically we've got ranges in the range of hundreds to thousands uh, of ppm. So unless you know precisely the oil and the state of the oil, ppm may not be your best value. And the same thing applies for lubrication oils. PPM is really a very difficult way to go. And you need to have a long trending of oils with certain data to make use out of that. So what are the other options here? Well, one of them is if I, if I do want PPM, I'm going to need a Carl Fisher device. We need tritation to uh, check the amount of particle in the oil or moisture particles in the oil. Uh, if you look at the old uh, Noria standards and recommendations, there was a crackle test and the crackle test would tell you uh, put a couple of drops of oil on a hot plate and cook it off and see uh, if you can interpret from the fizzing and bubbling in there what a PPM value would look like is very, very rough rule of thumb, I think, for, uh, for moisture content in oil. But today we're very lucky because we've got devices like the AquaSensor. Uh, which are extremely accurate and very, very good indicators. And the beautiful thing is they don't care what sort of oil it is. 
they're able to, for any mineral-based oil, uh, give you a saturation level. And that saturation level is a much more important value uh, when you're interpreting this. So you can see here from the above example, we expect at the point of 100% saturation, you start to get some cloudiness and uh, discoloration in the oil. Uh, obviously, we're looking at uh, a much uh, less contaminated oil down in the 40% range. Uh, and uh, it would be clearer, but you need a device one way or another that's going to be able to measure that for you. So again, looking at the two different oil types here, uh, you can see that uh, I, I could get into big trouble uh, with free water at 160 ppm for one type of oil, and I would not be worried at all uh, for another oil which might need 1400 ppm to become saturated. But the important thing here is not at which point I have complete saturation and free water. The important point is the moisture in the oil is damaging the oil, even at lower levels. So how do we remove it? Uh, there, there's a couple of different methodologies for that. One of them is the absorption method, and certainly Hydec and many other suppliers uh, provide filter elements, uh, which are water absorbing elements. And those elements typically use gels uh, or powder uh, as a medium, and they chemically bond the water molecules uh, into the element. So they're good for small amounts of water, but they're also targeted at free water, so above 100% saturation. So why vacuum dehydration? Vacuum dehydration has got some very beautiful characteristics. It means that we can definitely dry the oil down below saturation. Uh, we can process large volumes of oil quite quickly. And we have the possibility of uh, reaching levels which are unreachable in any other way. So let's have a look at how does the function of a vacuum dehydrator work. We all know that water freezes at zero at uh, sea level and it boils at 100 degrees Celsius. So that's our starting point, 100 degrees. But of course, we don't want to heat the oil up and burn the oil at that sort of temperature just to get rid of the moisture there. So what we can do is we place the oil under a vacuum and by decreasing the atmospheric pressure in the reaction chamber, we allow the moisture to boil off at a lower point. So it then becomes a combination of temperature and vacuum which allows us to change the state. And this is exactly what we're doing here. We're, we're making sure that the water molecules change state into a gas, because once they're changed into a vapor, a gas, we can then remove those. And the way that we remove them is by passing very warm air through the vacuum chamber, through the reaction chamber, and carrying away those vaporized moisture molecules. This is the trick in a good vacuum dehydrator. Now, what we've done in our new development here is that we've done a lot of research and development on the reaction that happens in the reaction chamber. So first of all, we need to have a great vacuum. We need to have a very good oil flow. We need to have great surface area and interaction between them, and we need to have controllability. So all of these things have been optimized in the new technology. And that's why we're so proud that this is a very, very effective solution. The other problem that very frequently uh, comes up is that managing purifiers or vacuum dehydrators can be a bit of a chore. And what we've done with the new technology is to put all of the science and know-how into the automatic control system. And it makes it very much plug and play. Uh, for you so that uh, this device can be just used and uh, it manages the situation with the correct oil temperature, the correct vacuum, the correct flow rates, and everything is done fully automatically with the operator not needing to get directly involved in that. What we have done uh, to, to make the unit uh, very efficient is also to have uh, cross-flow heat exchanges, uh, to have three different heating modules which can operate operate uh, at any time. Uh, they're running in series so that we don't run too hot and burn the oil at any one of our heating phases. 
and we return the oil back into the system uh, at a moderate temperature. There's a lot of features and benefits here, but uh, very much the best thing to do is uh, that we will show you exactly how this works. Okay, so let's go to the factory and have a look at the real thing. Come with me. Welcome to our factory where we produce our hydraulic power units and systems and we also produce our oil conditioning units. Here is an example our family of oil conditioning equipment with the VEU, uh, which is the varnish elimination unit, some oil filtration trolleys, and today we're going to show you the H2GO, which is our vacuum dehumidifier. You will see from the H2GO that it's a very, very compact unit. We've made it rugged for the Australian environment, and it's got many features which we think are benefits for you. Things like uh, forklift lifting pockets, lifting eyes for slinging the unit and it's very narrow so that it's able to be uh, put into places which are quite narrow. So one of the frequently expressed problems with using vacuum dehumidifiers is that they are difficult to use. You have to know a lot of settings and you have to be an expert in operating the system. We've taken all of that away with the H2GO. This is a fully plug-and-play, pre-programmed unit, which is extremely simple for the operator. There's a number of benefits that we've also included here. Things like phase detection, in case the phase when you plug in the unit is wrong, it will automatically tell you and it will correct that when you start up the unit. We've also got a cross-flow heat exchanger that we use for taking the hot oil out of the system back to the tank and preheating the oil to be processed in the unit. The unique design of our reaction chamber makes the unit extremely efficient. So now we will move to the startup phase and we will show you how to program the startup and it's as easy as that. The unit has very simple controls. You see there's an emergency stop and an abnormal condition light. Otherwise, the programming of the unit is most simple. Let's just make sure that we've not locked it. And then we go to the setup menu. The setup menu has one icon here, and that takes you to set the saturation mode. You can see here that the saturation mode is currently set at 15%. That can be altered by the user at will. And as an example here, I will set this for 10%. You'll also notice that there's an automatic shutoff function here. So as we run the unit, it can be set to automatically reach a target and then turn itself off. Once we're happy with the saturation target, we go to the main menu and it's as simple as starting the unit. What you will see is that we have VSD driving the pumps and you will start to get the symbol of the three heaters being switched on and the warm-up phase for the system is commenced. You will also see that the vacuum in the vacuum chamber has started to go down and that we're indicating flow in the reaction chamber. All of these settings are preset for you. You don't have to worry about them and they're optimized to make sure that the water removal is as fast and as efficient as possible. You can see now both of the pumps are running and the system is coming up to proper temperature. There is an inlet temperature signal here and there is a process temperature signal in the reaction chamber. So when you are satisfied with reaching the saturation level, you can shut the unit down or at any time you can shut it down. If we push the stop button here, you will hear the unit cycle down and you will see also on the screen here that there is a rundown time. The rundown means that the pump is still running and it makes sure that 
the oil which are in the heating elements is not being burnt by being stuck in the hot chamber. So this is just a small rundown phase which automatically protects the unit and protects your oil. Typically we are processing oil from a reservoir in a system or from a port of oil like this one which is a normal 1000 liter port. The unit is taking the oil from the port through the processing and returning it back again in a closed loop. Because we are not changing the state of the oil and changing the temperature of the oil, it's also possible to process directly in the hydraulic system while the system is operating in a live state. We only remove water and gas. We don't have any effect on the system. So there you are, our H2GO vacuum dehumidifier. We think it's a lovely unit, it's got a lot of features and benefits built in, and we're sure that it'll be a very important enhancement to your oil conditioning family of products. Thanks for joining us, and we'll come back to some more details in our webinar room. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed our uh, tour to the factory and a little glimpse uh, at the unit. Of course, there's a lot of other features and benefits there which we can show you in detail uh, with a longer demonstration. So, of course, uh, the subject here is uh, conditioning the oil and uh, we will be talking about other aspects of that with the filtration, uh, also with uh, varnish uh, removal and other subjects related to monitoring and condition monitoring in future webinars. It's important also for us to mention at this point that the H2GO is not a filter. It is a vacuum dehydrator. And that the reason that we put it with the family of uh, products here is because we believe that to have uh, perfect oil conditioning, you need to choose the right components and have those working together. It depends very much on what is the condition of the oil, how do we need to treat that and improve that condition, and that we have a family, a suite of products, which is suitable for doing that conditioning. I hope you've enjoyed the presentation. I'm very proud that we're able to release the H2GO today and that you've been able to join us for that uh, international release. And uh, I look forward to seeing you again in the next webinars. And please don't forget, HIDEC has webinars. We have another one tomorrow. We have uh, every week new additions to our series in the, uh, in the workshops and webinars. So please tune in, look for the upcoming webinars, and we'd be very happy to see you and uh, have you join us there. Great to be with you. Thank you. Bye for now.